Let me welcome you to our continuation of the study of public speaking. This is our eighth session, week number eight in public speaking. And I'm going to ask that you turn to page 94 in your workbook and let's look at the exercise for critical thinking. That, by the way, was your assignment. Now, since our last time, uh, our group went to Africa and Carlet was asked to speak uh, in Africa. And I wanted to know how that happened and how did it turn out? It went very well. What was the occasion? Uh, it was actually just, we were invited to church services that night. Okay. And the apostle there asked me if I would get up and come to church. Okay. So okay. I did and I also took the opportunity to call the group up. Yes. And to present them with something from Spirit of Liberty. Also. Awesome. With, with their ministry with the soup kitchen. Yes. So I got up and, and greeted the church and I, because I had never met the congregation maybe a handful of them okay. in the soup kitchen ministry. So I did greet the church and I pretty much told them how it felt and, and what Apostle Oscar and Pastor Daphne meant to us. Sure. What they had done and, and you know how we felt about being back in South Africa. Right. And then I called the group up and we spoke about them some more. Okay. And then we presented them, you know, we talked about what the ministry meant to us, the soup kitchen, sure. that meant mission and what it meant to us, what it did for us, and how we wanted to help them to continue to help others. That's great. And how many people were fed at the soup kitchen that day? A thousand people. A thousand? They, they feed kids. a thousand, but we ran out of soup, so everybody didn't. Get okay. Fed. All right. Yeah. That is amazing. And I'm sure that that was very fulfilling for you. It was, and I was very proud of myself because I never said, oh, one time. Look at you. <laughs> Give her a hand. Yeah. Give her I, a hand. Did, I didn't realize Alana's daughter was videoing. Okay. And so I was like, I know I didn't say, um, because I didn't feel it. I just felt really comfortable up there. There goes the Holy Spirit again when I get in Africa. Yeah. But I watched the video, and I was like, I never said, oh, one time. <laughs> All right now, yes. <laughs> congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah, um, you never know when you're going to be called on. Exactly. Yes. It can happen on your job. Mm -hmm. It can happen anywhere right. that you'll be called on, and we call it extemporaneous, where you've got to yes. speak from your heart yes. without yes. notes, speaking basically, you know, addressing whatever topic uh, you have to address. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the moment, so that that was good. Uh, obviously, um, the first time you did it with uh, Apostle Kaya was a baptism by fire. Yes, because it was. there was yes. at least six to eight thousand people in the audience, yes. and I remember that. I, re I remember that, uh, and and so then you got to speak to a smaller group this this time. And so, who knows what the next knows will the next? be? Uh, and um, uh, from what I understand, Apostle Kaya is starting a new church yes, in Johannesburg. We're going to be there yeah. at the end of July. End of this month. Yes. And so, um, we will probably have two churches to visit in Johannesburg. Um, Pastor oh, that's right. Colin that's Singh right. from yes. India. Uh, is starting a church in Johannesburg, mm -hmm. and um, I think we're going to reverse our order. We'll go there first and then end in Cape Town. So we we'll look forward to it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Jimmy, you could use that outline that's on that table right there. Yes. That's what I'm following. Yes, okay. Um, allow me to say that it's always uh, important. Um, this section is on critical thinking and it's always important for you to critique yourself uh, don't be hard on yourself but critique yourself and know exactly what you want to improve on because at the end of the day it's what's important to you uh, as a public speaker that you want to focus on and you'll find out that uh, that's important 
for you to be able to be good with whatever it is you want to improve upon. Last Saturday, a week from today, I had a funeral after our class uh, at four o'clock. And it was beautiful. It was a real beautiful ceremony. And I checked after the ceremony and I didn't say, uh, one time. <laughs> okay, in the whole sermon, in the whole sermon, in the whole uh, ceremony, the vows, the yeah. signing of the license, uh, all of that. Yeah. But you have to understand that it is um, being in the moment, right. understanding mm -hmm. the moment, and being prepared yes. for the moment knowing exactly what you want to say and where you want the occasion, you know, how you want to uh, f focus on the occasion. So it's different. It's, it's different when it is truly a public speaking situation. Yeah, it's truly different. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I would like to, if I could See, just the in the moment stuff. Yeah. Would have a with that. Yeah, you would have a problem. That's good. That's good. That's a good thing. All right, let's look at page uh, 94. And we are looking at exercises for critical thinking. Let's go through that. And you should have your assignment available. So we're going to look at that. Now, it says, using one of the brainstorming methods described in this chapter, come up with three topics you might like to deal with in your next classroom speech. For each topic, devise a specific purpose statement suitable for the speech assignment. Make sure your specific purpose statements fit the guidelines discussed in the chapter. Here are several specific purpose statements for classroom speeches. Identify the problem or problems with each. Uh, to inform my audience how to sign up for Facebook. To persuade my audience that the US government should increase funding for stem cell research and support the development of hydrogen fuel vehicles. What is an individual retirement account? To inform my audience why square grooves are superior to U-shaped grooves on golf clubs. To inform my audience about New Zealand. Donate blood. To persuade my audience that something has to be done about the problem of antibiotics resistant bacteria. Below are three sets of main points for speeches. For each set, supply the general purpose, specific purpose, and central idea. All right, so who would like to be first with your assignment? What was your um, topic? Uh, what was your general purpose, your specific purpose, your central idea, your main points. Declare, of course. All right. Okay, I chose the topic uh, gun violence. That's a good one. And the uh, central purpose, well, the general purpose was to inform. All right, so his topic was gun violence, which is definitely relevant. Okay? And your general purpose was to inform versus what? Well, well actually it was versus uh, In other words, if it's not to inform students, what is it? To persuade. To persuade. If it's not to persuade, it's to what? Inform. Okay. okay. And my, the, the, purpose, the specific purpose was to inform my audience about school shootings, how it has affected the survivors and the community and family abroad. Okay. And what to do to get help. Okay. All right. And my central idea is, is public schools, colleges, universities, 
in the United States have had a lot of students and a lot of, well, and I'm sorry, it had a lot of shooting incidents. Faculty, students, survivors have been traumatized and help is available for the survivors. Okay, all right. Did you develop a main, your main points? Well, that was my main point with the central idea. Okay, well, your central idea uh, can Your central idea is a, is a broad. Oh, it's broad. Okay, I understand. No, 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 no. Listen, listen, listen. I'm sorry. Your your central idea communicates what you want to say to your audience, right. and then your main points will explain your central idea. Okay, so it's okay that you said it was in your central idea, but in your central idea, you extract your main points. Okay. And then you actually give them okay. your main points. And so within this, the, what I really would need to communicate is how the shootings affected the survivors. Okay. All right. How school shootings affect the survivors. survivors. Okay, so that could be one point. Okay. All, right. All right. That's fine. And so you can build off of that. Okay. How the survivors or how gun violence affects the community outside of the school or university. Right. How gun violence <clears throat> can influence law and the development are the um, changes of laws associated with gun violence. Okay. All of those can come yeah. out of your, your central idea. Okay. Absolutely. Anyone else who would like to be? Number one or number three? Number one. Number one or number three of what? Are we on number one for the assignment? Or? No. Well, it's number three. Do I straight to number three? No, we. No, 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 no. I'm going over your assignment. So yes. you are on number one. On number one. Yes. Oh. Is it not on page ninety four? No. Yes. yes, sir. But I only. I understood it to be specific purpose statement suitable for my piece. Okay. Yeah. And what else? That's it. Okay. Okay. So maybe I got ahead of the the That's chapter. That's good. I just wanted to make sure. No problem. No problem. <laughs> Maybe I, I got ahead, but no. uh, Deacon Larry obviously went through the whole. Yes, you no, no, no. You see, I'm on number one. He just said, answered what you asked him on the yeah, after. Come so. up with three topics you might like to like to deal with and give a specific and, purpose. And that's what I did. That's what I was working on. Okay, one. so did I tell you just to do number one? No, no, no. no what we're saying you is, know. you asked him about a central idea yeah and you yes. asked him about a general purpose but it only asked us to give a specific purpose statement okay which is that one okay all but right we have to give three team three topics topics three different topics right yes okay got it i said i don't know i'm looking at very very kidding all right okay yeah, that's why you so asked me to marry this team oh well, we don't know three topics or just just one just one just one. Okay. All right. Uh, my number one was hazing. Your and number one was what? My number one topic was hazing. Hazing. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Because I wanted to inform my audience about the importance of educating their children and grandchildren. Okay. About hazing in fraternities and sororities. Because many grandparents are raising children. Sure. So I want to reach not only the parents, but the grandparents as well. Okay, all right. Because so we're losing too many children. Okay, yes, some of some hazing has uh, actually been critical enough uh, that uh, there's been loss of lives. Mm -hmm. So in fraternity, they do hazing. But yeah, yeah. I use the word to inform. Yes. But maybe I might want to also persuade them. Okay, yes, you can. 
you know, yeah. to educate these kids before sending them on. Sure. Okay. That's good. You can do that. Yeah. All right. Carla? Well, my, one of my topics is self-love. Okay. And my specific purpose statement is to inform my audience about the psychological strengths and weaknesses of self-love. All right. Okay. That's a good topic. Mm -hmm. uh, it was interesting. Um, let's see. Maybe two weeks ago, I was listening to the radio uh, in the morning, and I heard an interview with someone, with Joe Dupree, and the person said, I remember a quote from Dr. Lloyd, and the quote she gave was about how can you love anyone if you don't love yourself. Mm -hmm. That's true. Now, I'm sure I said that in many sermons, <laughs> but it was interesting that she said that that impacted her, that she said from that point she'd been focusing on loving herself. And that is critical. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that is critical. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a good topic. It can we be can... a good thing and it, it, it just depends. You know, some people can be selfish in that self that comes with Yes. That. So that's why mine was to inform about, you know, there are psychological strengths, there's weaknesses. Also. Sure. You're right, the balance. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. And, and one of those weaknesses, Carlette, would be a psychological issue mm -hmm. uh, with self-love. And on the negative side, it changes from self-love to narcissism. Okay, so narcissism is loving yourself too much. That mm -hmm. like, I don't like myself. It is. Because I used to have a friend that was dominant. And it's like, since he was in um, middle school, he's been that way. He was so into himself. Like, he was, more, he was worse than a woman. He has to see the mirror. If he, if he get his pants dirty, he has to go change it to look good. And it's like, even for high school, even, I think his adult life, I think he's still the same. But if he never changed, like, even if he had a pimple, yeah. he was the ugliest thing. Like, Dominic, even though he's married now, but the thing is like, he, he, he was like that until he was in our 20s. Narcissism is a psychological disorder. Mm -hmm. We have it in the White House. <laughs> yeah. Big time. Yeah. Every topic comes right back to him. Anything he's addressing in the country, he compares it to himself somehow. Yeah. And there have been psychologists who have actually said our president yeah. has psychological disorders. Okay. <laughs> that's pretty scary. That's, that's pretty scary. That's pretty scary. But the truth is, we all have psychological yes. disorders yes. of some kind. Exactly. It may not be as severe as, as others, others. Yeah. but we're all broken in some way. Exactly. Yeah. You know? Do you think that everybody, because we have emotions, that we all have to some extent, um, I would say, even by hope? Depending on the way you, I don't know. I, I guess I, I'm, I'm asking that because of my experience with somebody recently. Finish your question. I, I guess I'm. <laughs> I guess I'm asking because we we do have emotions. Would it be safe to say that we all might, or maybe not, maybe experience it at some point in time in our lives? You may be diagnosed with it depending on how severe it is. Yeah. But can we all experience that without actually being diagnosed? So like a temporary situation? Temporary yeah. Yes. Yeah. It may be just, just a similar. I saw that recently with somebody, and I don't know if I, if it's a, an episode that they had and mm -hmm. they would need to control it so they don't have any more often. It was just the way they reacted sure. to a certain situation that was going on. Yeah, it could be, um, it can be uh, momentary. 
it could be you know an isolated situation. Um, it can be chronic. When it's chronic, it is happening too often. Yes. Yeah. Or you know medical attention at least. You know. So it is um, possible. Yes, that there are uh, degrees of psychological disorders. Definitely. I have a young pastor that consulted with me uh, maybe a month ago. His church is in Rankato. He's looking for a covering to be his bishop. So he approached me and he's now under my covering. So what he was teaching his congregation when we met for our first or second meeting, he was doing a series on psychological disorders. I gave him a book uh, out of my library related to psychological disorders. Yeah, and in the church in particular, psychological disorders in the church. Okay, so pastors need to know how to diagnose disorders within this congregation. Yes. 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 That that those that's important for a pastor. Some cases you may be able to address, but the most important thing is being able to know and detect and understand what it, what's really going on. Okay. So yes, uh, people can have varying degrees of psychological disorders. And in a lot of cases, they don't know it's a disorder. And you'll find out, I remember, um, I actually taught a class in seminary on psychological, understanding psychological disorders. I, I think that was the title of the class. Mm -hmm. And you will be surprised of the people who don't know that they have a psychological disorder. Mm -hmm. And those that do know, you know, may have different ways of dealing with it, you know. So, yes, there are varying degrees. Varying Honestly, degrees. I recently saw how somebody reacted to a certain situation, and I kept saying, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get And then somebody else mentioned bipolar, and then I stopped to think. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's exactly what it looks like. Mm -hmm. But I don't see that person as being severe or being that way all the time, or mm -hmm. even often now that I'm around that person all the time. So that's why I wondered if um, I'll tell you, uh, one, that a lot of times go unnoticed. It's passive aggressive behavior. That's that's a psychological disorder mm -hmm. where the person exemplifies passive aggressive behavior. That means that sometimes that person is detached or unengaging. Mm -hmm. All right? And then that same person can be overly engaging or uh, overly extroverted, you follow me? Oh my goodness, I wore myself too then. Okay, so that. maybe the diagnosis yeah. was passive aggressive. Maybe so, maybe uh, so that's And that can, happen, that, that can happen uh, with anyone. Mm -hmm. But again, it depends on the severity yeah. and, and the degree uh, of it. And the frequency, right. does it happen all the time? Does it happen frequently? Okay, so uh, passive aggressive behavior, in my opinion, is one of those uh, psychological disorders that can be most offensive. Oh, yeah. Can be most offensive. That, that, e that's even, exactly what that was. Yes, even in its passive state. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's maybe that's, that's a class we need to teach. Wow. Maybe that's a class.
we need, you know. But it is true. Now, does it, the, if it's a, just a mild case or it's not all the time, does that necessarily mean eventually it will? Not necessarily. Or not, in, okay. not necessarily, no. Not necessarily. There are people who live with uh, degrees of psychological disorders. It's there. It's there. It's there. You know what? It, you know where it is. It's in their genes. It's in their DNA. So that's now, that's who they are. Well, now that you mention that, that's what I think we saw mm -hmm. and said, and not my organism. Yeah. Bye. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jane. But someone that we saw, would a people spirit be able to grab a hold of that we saw and cause that person to do something? Sure. Sure. So they can even though it's a monster. Sure. If they're not in the Lord, then they subject to Absolutely. And not only passive aggressive behavior, but any mental disorder. Yes, yes. Any mental right. disorder. Okay. There's a fine yes. line between demon possession right. or demon oppression. Right. And Psychological disorders. Right. And now don't get me wrong, I would like to glorify him. Of course not. All his cohorts or whatever. Yes, yes. But what y'all just discussed, in my mind, I'm looking at this, it's mild. But if this person is not in the Lord or someone is not praying for this person, then. Yes, it can, it can, um, it, it can escalate. The reason why I'm saying that, Bishop, because after, before I was in the Lord, I used to hear people committing a crime. And then when they were uh, interrogated, they would say, I don't remember. But before I was in the Lord, I used to say, why they are But now that I'm in the Lord, I realize that some a demon can attach itself. Sure. And cause that person to do that. Yes. So the person is not conscious. When the demon is controlled. Sure, that's true. So, in a sense, they're not lying when they say some. Mm -hmm. They're not lying when they say, I don't remember. I don't remember doing that. That's but true. But yet their body did. Mm -hmm. That's true. People who are alcoholics do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Alcoholism is another disorder. Right. It's a disease. Blackout. Okay. I've had that twice. Okay. I think that was where I had gone out, had a good time, and uh, I ended up buying a super family order of chicken. I <laughs> got home and ate it all, and the next morning I got up and hungry as could be. And Irma told me, how can you be hungry on a chicken you ate? I did not remember. But when I went to the kitchen, the box was sitting there. <laughs> Have mercy. So because you drank. Okay. But yeah. you know, if you're inebriated or, or yes. like she said, even a mild case of a mental disorder, your judgment is impaired at that time. Exactly. So I would think that is when you're not at your, you know, your best and right. your strong. You can't reason. So, yeah, then you can be, but, um, but the point, advantage of by uh, evil spirits. Anyway. Yes, but the point that, that Jane is mentioning is important because if that person is an unbeliever, that person would not be able to discern that this is not me. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And and the case can become severer, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, demons are attracted to that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Any weakness, yes. yeah. And 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 demons like rats look for trash. Okay. So any kind of trash you have in your spirit, mm -hmm. in your life. Demons are uh, attracted to it. Better. I just want to make a comment. I've noticed that, and I'm not criticizing you, please don't get me wrong with this, but I've noticed that a lot of people do not, do not want to give Satan any credit. And I'm saying that you're not giving him credit, but the Bible says we fight power and principalities in high places. And it also says that our battle is not carnal. That's right. So regardless of what kind of illness it is, it's still a demonic mm -hmm. 
uh, it's it's still demonic. It can it, have it, a demonic uh, origin. Right. Origin. Because all sin right. came from the fall. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So so it can be used. And there's nothing wrong with calling out yes. the devil or demons. You you have to use some wisdom with that. Yes. Because uh, everybody is not uh, necessarily acquainted with demonic terms or you can lose a person, right. um, you can spook a person, mm -hmm. you can make them feel like they are, uh, you know, uh, uh, susceptible mm -hmm. and that they are so different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's again, the word is balanced. But yeah. I'm saying that as far as the sermon, you can see a position. Yes. You know, when you discern, if you look at a person and that person is not normally like that, yeah. you can almost see that. You can see even in the changes of their face and the yeah. way they yeah. react to Absolutely. this. Absolutely. So that's what I'm talking about. That it's, it, it could be temporary. Yes. You know, and because, and, 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 and you know, I know because of this happened to me, as far as that's not me. When you say your character? Yes. Yes. Because sometimes you, you, you'll just react to something and why did I do that? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But not every illness is demonic. Is, is demonic. No. I mean, because we make our own choices. True. Like, like I have a brother who used to go and inhale gasoline from a water hose. Yeah. And then he went on top of my mama's house and he thought he could fly. Yeah. But that's you, you know, he was just bad like that when he was young. Like the stories I heard about him, I thank God that boy had some sense by the time I was born. <laughs> but he did some things and it was just him being rebellious. You know, he couldn't get spanked or whatever because he had these big braces. So he did a lot of things just on his own, just being bored and whatever. And so, I mean, it's not always a demonic it, it's, it's, it's not always. Yes. It, no, definitely. It, it's not necessary that it always is. That's true. Yes. Come on in. Oh. Yeah, that 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 is definitely true. You know. I mean, I don't want to say don't blame Satan for everything. Like I care, but it's because we have to take some responsibility. Sometimes you can't always sit and blame Satan, and then you may need to change some things that you're doing sure. about yourself. Sure. Because it really just simply be you. Sure. A choice that you made. Yes, and. When it comes to the behavior of your brother, that behavior could be genetic too. It could be in any. some ways that he's acting out something that is unique to his personality. Yeah, that was just him. You know, that's that's what it's, yeah. Nobody else. And 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 then when you make those bad choices, sometimes mm -hmm. you put yourself in a position where you can be successful now. To an evil spirit coming in because now you've compromised yourself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but it doesn't always have to start out as a demonic. Attack. No, mm -hmm. no, no. That's true. That's true. But you're right, Betty, you can discern it. Yes. And especially when it gets to the point where it's out of control. Exactly. And when it gets to the point where it is uh, offensive. Uh, and destructive to the person and or to other people, most definitely. So, and, yeah. and another comment that I wanted to make is one a lot of the reaction that I've noticed, you know, I used to be very hardcore about different things. Yeah. But a lot of the reaction that I see, I'm, I'm going to take my family for example, that those are inherited. Yes. When you talk about DNA and genetics, yes. you're talking about inheritance. Yes. But we do have generational curses. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so that we which, which is actually connected exactly. to those things. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, okay. yes. And I'm going to let you get to this. With generational curses, they can be broken. With prayer and fasting, right? They can be broken with what? Prayer and fasting. Absolutely. 
Yes, yes. Uh, at, at some point, when you recognize something as a generational curse, you can start with you. With you. Yes, and that's true, unless they want, they want it. To yes, they have to really understand that it's yes. there. Yes, they have absolutely. to admit to it that it's there. Yes, absolutely. Yes. But you can start, what you're saying is you can start, start with yourself. You can start with yourself. If you identify something yes. that right. could be a generational curse, mm -hmm. right. you can start with you. Yes. And you can actually minister self-deliverance. Exactly. Addressing those generations. So you, can, you can break that from you. Yes. From down. Yes, you can. But then those before you, if they don't, that's just yeah. them. Yes. That's right. Yes. 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 But yes. Sorry and you. and you start with you and anyone who is open in your family, you can also right. help so them through that. Yes. But the first step is acknowledging it, right? that it exists. Yes. You had a question, Jimmy? Comment? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I was, uh, I don't remember what I was saying, because I was writing down the 10 different okay. disorders. So okay. I was somewhere else. <laughs> okay, no, no problem. We will, yes, it, it may come back. All right. Lenora, welcome. <laughs> it looks yeah. like you came bearing some, some love. Yes. And I see you went to one of my favorite places. Oh, really? Yes. yes. All right. Okay, if you have your workbook, though, we, we are on page 94. And uh, Betty, you're next, right? Yes. Okay, so let's let's conclude with, with, with your comments unless. Um, Nora wants to share her comments. Go ahead, Betty. Well, I, the three, I picked three uh, topics, but I'm going to just go with one because you talk about it all the time. Okay. Uh, are you talking about topics or purpose statement? I'm going to do the purpose statement okay. and the topic. Go ahead. Okay, uh, you talk about you all the time. And <laughs> <laughs> I what she did. But I had already did it when we started talking. I think it was that Bible study yeah. he brought up, <laughs> and I laughed because that was one of my topics. That's amazing. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, my, my statement is uh, to inform. Okay. Using a dry, dry or powdered root is better for your health because it has less sodium and no saturated fat in its contents. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. All right. You know, a lot of people still use the old fashioned when you're making it and stuff. Sure. But the dry root is much better for you, it's true. That's amazing. Okay, that's amazing. I think that uh, people need to really know and be conscious of everything I buy, I check the content. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's packaged. Uh, it, and, you know, uh, a lot of the foods that are in jars you got to watch that mm -hmm. and sodium content is very important in right. anything in anything and i threw some food away yesterday because the sodium level was too high and the saturated fat also absolutely you know, yeah so you have to watch that too yeah. that I've got. and it gives it to be honest with you if you know how to cook and you know how to do the right spices it is delicious sure you wouldn't yeah. even know that it's missing Right, yeah. and it's not oiled. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, like before you had to skim the top. Sure. <laughs> yeah, the one you and you don't have to skim right. it anymore. Yes, for sure. All right, well, this has been good. Um, uh, Lenora, we are on page 94. We were discussing the assignment from the last time. Let's, let's move now to page 82. All right, and we're going to look at reviewing uh, determining the general purpose and I want to make sure that you're clear on that because we didn't spend a lot of time the last time uh, dealing with that so on page 82 page 82 determining the general purpose highlight in the left column 
the definition of general purpose, the broad goal of a speech. So a synonym for the word purpose is goal. Whatever your purpose is, it's your goal. So along with choosing a topic, you need to determine the general purpose of your speech. Usually, and again, that's why I said Deacon Larry, it was broad yeah. what you said about your general purpose. Right. It's supposed to be. <coughs> it was supposed to be. And then out of that, you can come up with points, main points, or specific points. All right, so usually it will fall into one of two overlapping categories, to inform or to persuade. When your general purpose is to inform, if you don't have this highlighted, you should highlight it. You act as a teacher or lecturer. Your goal is to convey information clearly, accurately, and interestingly. <laughs> if you describe how to lift weights, narrate the major events of the latest Middle East crisis, or report on your sorority's financial position, you are speaking to inform, all right? So you are both, all of you are aware of the two categories, to inform or to persuade, all right? So you have to get that clear. And you will find out, students, that it will come automatically. You're not even gonna think about it. Once you come up with your topic, it's going to determine. I'm instructing, I'm informing, I am persuading. Uh, based on the topic you pick, it will come automatically. So what I'm saying is that you will usually not think about I want something to inform or I want something to persuade okay. unless that's what you want. You follow me? Every time I go into my classroom at Southern University, I am going to inform right. every time, right. okay? So you have to determine that if you determine it beforehand, there's nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is that as you develop as a public speaker, it will come automatically that what is most important is your topic. What's most important is your topic. What's most important is your topic. Whether that topic is to inform or persuade is secondary to your topic, okay? Your topic is most important. It will automatically fall into one of those two categories. But your topic is important. One of the things I am complimented about the most in my ministry is that people remember the topics and my sermon titles. But I do that intentionally. I'm intentional about choosing topics. And that becomes second hand after a while, becomes second nature. Questions about to inform or to persuade, comments. Can, can, yes. a, can a speech be uh, both? Yes. Yes, there will be times when your topic is so important that you will have an aspect of that topic that your intent is to persuade. So let's let's pick one that we've talked about already. That hazing. The hazing, exactly. That that Jane pick. A lot of people don't know the extent of hazing. Some people don't know what hazing is. Mm -hmm. All right, and you inform, and then you persuade. Mm -hmm. You persuade, mm -hmm. and maybe your persuasion is to use caution if your children, grandchildren, or whoever are involved in hazing, that they understand the consequences of hazing. Because I've noticed that a lot in your sermons. Yes. 
I'm, in, I'm intentional about that. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, Jimmy? Like when um, Katrina happened, even though it was in Florida, and Dr. Chavez passed, and Professor Chavez passed, we had to do a persuasive with also doing the research of finding out like why shouldn't they a persuasive essay which was long and you had to find facts about why should they not rebuild uh, New Orleans or why should they but you still have to go to the beach and have to get polling have to get like people to say um, like a research like um go ask people why should they build like besides your own thinking of why they shouldn't you have to go um, to do a survey a survey there you go a survey and then you have to break down the survey in its percentage and, and and you go from there but you have to persuade the classroom why they should go up for so depending on what position you take yes sir. Um, for sure absolutely questions Next paragraph. Carlette, would you take that when your general purpose? When your general purpose is to persuade, you act as an advocate or a partisan. You go beyond giving information to espousing a cause. I like that. You go beyond giving information to espousing a cause. Continue. You want to change or structure the attitude or actions of your audience. Notice the two italicized words. Change, structure. Okay? Attitudes or actions. <clears throat> Continue. If you try to convince your listeners that they should start a regular program of weightlifting, that the United States should modify its policy in the Middle East, or that your soror sorority should start a fundraising drive to balance its budget, then you are speaking to persuade. In doing so, you cannot help but give information, but your primary goal is to win over your listeners to your point of view. Stop right there. That's your answer, Ben. Mm -hmm. You can do both. You can do both. Highlight that. In doing so, you cannot help but give information. Mm -hmm. But your primary goal is to win over your listeners to your point of view to get them to believe something or do something as a result of your speech. Continue. In speech classes, the general purpose is usually specified as part of the speech assignment. For speeches outside the classroom, however, you have to make sure of your general purpose yourself. Usually this is easy to do. Are you going to explain, report, or demonstrate something? Then your general purpose is to inform. All right, highlight that. Those questions are important. Are you going to explain, report, or demonstrate something? Then that category is what? To inform. To inform. All right, continue. Are you going to sell, advocate, or defend something? Highlight that series of questions. Are you going to sell, advocate, or defend something? Go ahead. Then your general purpose <clears throat> is to persuade. All right. But no matter what the situation, you must be certain of exactly what you hope to achieve by speaking. Highlight that last line. But no matter <laughs> what the situation, you must be certain of exactly what you hope to achieve by speaking. Now, I turned down a speaking engagement recently. And I mentioned it in church. I mentioned that I got invited to the city council to address the issues associated with um, the laws that came as a result of the civil rights movement, or rather uh, the laws that came after slavery. I'm sorry? Napoleonic laws? Uh, no, uh, the term is not Napoleonic. Um, the, the, the term has to do with laws specifically that would limit 
African Americans. Jim Crow. Jim Crow, yes. Okay, Jim Crow laws. So I was contacted by the president of the NAACP, and I said, in the text, it sounded like an invitation. And I said, I'll be there. I got a second text saying, we want you to speak. And I said, okay. And we set up a meeting. I set up a meeting with uh, uh, the chairperson of this organization that is spearheading a movement in the city <laughs> that is addressing some of the Jim Crow laws and effects of Jim Crow in Louisiana. After I had the meeting with the person, I said, I don't know if I'm comfortable with addressing specifically the issue of the General Mouton statue, downtown Lafayette. I went when there was a protest for the removal of the statue. I was there, okay? And then the chairperson said, we don't want you to necessarily address the government Mouton or the, yeah, uh, the General Mouton statue. But Jim Crow, and I said, I deal with Jim Crow in my classes all the time at some, okay? I thought about it the next day, and I, and I text the chairperson of the NAACP, and I said, I think I'm going to decline, only because I had not attended some previous meetings when other people address the Jim Crow laws, okay? And I wanted to get the, uh, what's the word? I, I wanted to get the pulse mm -hmm. of the community and what they were saying and what they were advocating and what the end goal was. From what I understood, the end goal was the removal of Confederate statues and symbols. You know, like, like the Confederate flag and things, anything that, that symbolized slavery or was connected with Jim Crow laws. And the more I thought about it, I said, I could address in general Jim Crow, but for me, I wanted to be more specific for my city. And that would be a reflection on me right. to the city council. Okay, so I declined. I got a screaming text back, <laughs> screaming without words in terms of verbal screaming. But I knew the president of the NAACP wasn't happy with me declining. And so I got in large letters, all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I didn't care because for me, my, my number one priority, I was getting my students ready for a midterm exam uh, at Southern, and I was working on my exam. I felt like that took precedence yeah. and priority over me being there to speak for five minutes about a topic that I was not sure the direction of the group was right. going. Yeah, so you really couldn't give it to him. Sure. You didn't have the pulse. Of right. I didn't have the pulse of where they were going. The chairperson told me pretty much what they were doing. I understood it. But the context and the audience that I would be speaking to would have had months and weeks of information that was presented already. Right. Suppose I would present something that was presented the week before or the month before. You see, I didn't know that. I never do anything without having enough information. Yes. Never. Never. Because at the end of the day it's a reflection on you. So if if you're deep if you're given a topic that you're uncomfortable with, I wasn't uncomfortable with it. What I was uncomfortable was with was the direction 
I needed to go with that. So I need to sit in some more city council meetings dealing just with that and knowing more and attending some of the meetings of the organization that have started the movement. Right. You know, so, you know what? I, I don't care how they felt about it. Right. I really don't. Yeah, right. You know, they're going to have to love me anyway. What are they going to do about it? <laughs> okay. I'm still a figure in this community. Yeah. I'm still representing a constituency in this community. So the bottom line is, uh, Maybe next time. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. Okay, really, Maybe you're next truly, time. You truly help uh, the community by not stepping out there unprepared. Exactly. Or uninformed. Uninformed. Yes. Some people are more um, interested in just getting what they want. Yeah. You know, or having to say something, but you, I would think that they would understand. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want anybody speaking on something if they can't be thorough with the information yes. and, 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 you know, if it's yeah. not helpful. And, and what they, they were trying to really push for, more African-American speakers. That's something that came out of my meeting yeah. with the chairperson. We just don't have enough blacks stepping up and talking. Okay, so I'm black. Yes, you know, I'm black. But I, okay, you know, so... Uh, uh, yes, I'm black and I have knowledge of Jim Crow and Jim Crow laws, but um, what has gone before me? What was said? What needs yet to be said? I didn't have that information. So I'm saying that to say in that last line, Carla, read it again. Uh, are you going to sell? Read that last line. Are you going to sell, advocate, or defend something? Okay, so I was going to advocate and defend something. Right. You see, yeah. exactly, my point exactly. Yes. I could defend it in a general sense, right. but not in a specific sense mm -hmm. in terms of the direction it wanted to go. Continue. Then your general purpose is to persuade. But no matter what the situation, you must be certain of exactly what you hope to achieve by speaking. Thank you. What was I going to achieve? Exactly. I knew what I wanted to achieve, but I wasn't speaking just for myself. Exactly. So you have to be careful of all of that, all of that. Some people are more uh, interested in grandstanding. <laughs> A lot of people are just interested in being seen and are heard. Okay, uh, I I don't have that need. And when you speak to an audience like that, I know it's specific. It is. It is specific. Yes, yeah. yes, it is specific. But not to 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 come into what you were saying when they did it in New Orleans. Okay, then NAACP was at the seat. He was there too, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they got it done there. Mm -hmm. So my, my point is, why are they saying there's not enough black speakers or black in Lafayette? Yeah. Yes. The Lafayette City Council, uh, and I guess the Lafayette chapter, wasn't getting enough blacks to address that issue of Jim Crow. Oh yeah, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of African Americans representing that topic, for sure. All right, let's go on to determining the specific purpose. Declaring once you have chosen, would you read that? Once you have chosen the topic and the general purpose, you must narrow your choices to determine the specific purpose of your speech. All right, now notice the progression. You start general. And if you go back to that definition in the left margin, what is the general purpose? The broad goal of a speech. Okay? But now look at what you're reading, Larry. You must what? You must narrow your choices to determine the specific purpose of your speech. There you go. So you start with the general and you move to um, to narrow your choice to a specific purpose, all right? 
Yes, now before you move further, Larry, let me give an illustration. I, I've done this in seminary before. Um, usually, if you would imagine a circle, all right, that circle is the broad topic or the general purpose. You add another circle within that circle, that becomes your specific, all right? You can even add to that another circle where you're now trying to target or persuade related to your specific. You follow what I'm saying? So always think in terms of concentric circles, circles within a circle, all right? And you're moving from the general to the specific to the point. Okay, because you do want to make a point. All right, so that is a good way of illustrating it and helping you to understand where you're going when you are giving a speech. You may not be thinking of circles when you're speaking, but you're speaking of broad and specific things. Are you with me? All right, continue, Deacon Larry. Highlight that. Not many, but one. One aspect of a topic. That's why I added that third circle after the general, after the specific, that target. That one aspect of a topic. Because like I said, Larry, out of the uh, topic you chose, it was broad enough that you could get some main points out of that. You see, you could get several points out of that. So that was a good thing. Continue, Larry. Okay. You should be able to state your specific purpose by using an infinitive phrase to inform my audience about. All right, that's an infinitive phrase. I am going to inform my audience about. Continue. To persuade my audience to. All right. That indicates precisely what you hope to accomplish with your speech. All right. So that, that's what you want to accomplish with your speech. Now, I have, I'm honored to say that I have a number of students who over the years have sat where you're sitting and have gone on to do bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees, okay? And when you do a doctorate, you are required to do a dissertation which is equivalent to a book, all right? And in the process of doing your doctorate, there are stages where you have to defend each part of your dissertation. If it's too broad, you will fail. And you go back and start all over because it was too broad. It wasn't narrow enough. So you have to keep working on getting to narrow that topic. That's true in public speaking, it's true in research, it's true in writing, okay? You have to get to the specific. And you can be too broad with a topic that you become ineffective because your audience could go anywhere with that information but you want to target a specific thing that you want to address, all right? So think, think of that. And there's a term, I'll, I'll ask that you write it in your notes. The term that is associated with it, and I'll ask one of you to Google it, the term in terms of writing is called D-D-E, limitation, delimitation are just to delimit, all right? So whenever we talk about delimitation, look it up for me, Carlette. You will find out that that's the process that you're going through to become more specific.
you see in the word delimitation. What word? Limit. So that means you're trying to limit your topic to a specific topic. So delimitation, I don't want to give you the answer, I want you to find it. Delimitation is a process. Once you find it, Carlin, let me know. Um, I have one that says it literally means the act of process of fixing limits or boundaries of territorial constituents in a country or province. I think this is this has to do with boundaries. Yeah. But there's another one that says these are choices made by a researcher. There you go. Which should be mentioned. They describe the boundaries that you have set for your study. There you go. Um, this is a place to explain the things that you are not doing and why you have chosen not to do them. That's good. All right. So in other words, uh, let's say we're taking um, say a topic that is specific okay if I say the word racism is that specific mm -mm. well that's, that's general, general I would think like I think oh. Oh. I mean, I might tend to say, well, what about racism? Yeah. So, yeah. I would think it's not. Really so, that, that's a broad topic. Racism yeah. is a broad topic. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Or it could be counter racism. It could be reverse discrimination mm -hmm. type of racism. You see? Okay. So, so there, there's a lot that can be done. So, when, when we talk about the term, delimitation. That means actually in a speech you will actually say to your audience I will not deal with this aspect. I will not deal with that aspect. I will not deal with that aspect. That's delimitation. You eliminate what they might be thinking you're going to deal with and you let them know I'm not dealing with that. I will not deal with racism from the perspective of African Americans. I will deal with racism as it relates to Hispanics only. That's delimitation. You see, so what did I just do? I eliminated African Americans. So my audience is not trying to hear anything about African Americans. And I'm not trying to communicate anything about African Americans. So the term delimitation means that you're eliminating what is general to become more specific. I'll have uh, Carlette give the definition again. And the you're research. Focus on what you tell them that you are going to speak Exactly. About, and they're not expecting to hear the other stuff. Exactly. Because at the end of your speech, someone will walk up to you and say, you left out Asians, or you left out, you know, um, Europeans. But if you say it in advance, they're not expecting to hear it. The term is delimitation. Go ahead, then. You say what you're not going to say? Yes. Oh, okay, because I was just saying you directly say what you're gonna say. You will do that too. So okay. You will do that too. My specific topic is racism among Hispanics. Okay. And in my presentation on racism among Hispanics, I will exclude how racism has affected African Americans. I will exclude how Europeans have uh, promoted forms of racism. Okay? And so that, that is specific and you could make that even more specific. Okay? I will deal with racism among Hispanics in Lafayette, Louisiana. Not in Texas, not in California. See how that circle became smaller? Yes. Okay. Racism is the large circle, mm -hmm. right? Hispanic racism is a smaller circle. Mm -hmm. 
and then Hispanics in Lafayette is my target audience. Okay, on topic. Look, they are standing here. I'm sorry? They are, they are standing here. They're, they're migrating here. Which is yes, it's a larger percentage. Yes, go ahead. Oh. You can, when, when you're saying that you're not going to do such as with all the things, can you say that, can you use the question that, I mean, the statement is, I am dealing with Hispanic racism in the Hispanic community in Lafayette. Oh, no, just leave Lafayette out. And look, only. Only. Like, okay, you're only dealing with racism with with the Hispanics. Yes, you can say that. Okay. But what I'm saying is that that too is too broad. It's too broad? Okay. That's what I'm that saying. too is too broad. Because someone in the audience will say, well, Hispanics in California don't feel that way. Right. Yeah. Okay. See? Mm -hmm. So that, that's why you got to narrow that circle even more. Yeah. Okay? Give us that definition again, Carlin, and I do want you to add it to your notes. The term is delimitation. These are choices made by the researcher, which should be mentioned. They describe the boundaries that you have set for the study, and this is the place to explain the things that you are not doing and why you have chosen not to do them. There you go. All right, give us the uh, web address or the URL for that. Where did it come it's, from? Uh, bcps.org. Bcps.org. So if you look up the term delimitation, look for that particular website. All right, questions? In, in the screenshot. Okay. You're going to send it in a screenshot. Okay, good. <clears throat> That's good. All right, so. I like what you just said about the limitations because when yes. you're listening, yes. if the audience is truly paying attention, they themselves know not to expect that. That's the point exactly. So they should run to you after the speech with some off the wall thing that yes. you already addressed at yeah. the beginning. Yeah, I, you already said I'm not addressing it. Right. those things. I don't want to address those things. Right. That's why it's so important to listen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so that is critical to being specific with your theme as well as your purpose. All right. Go ahead, Deacon Larry. For example. For example, Wayne Winfield, the student at Lawrence State University, decided to give his first classroom speech on the topic from his personal experience. For the past two years, he had volunteered his time to perform music for patients <clears throat> in mental hospitals, nursing homes, and residents for disabled adults. He had seen how enthusiastically the patients responded to music, even when they remained unmoved by other kinds of stimuli. The Wayne's experience had given him a better understanding of the benefits of music therapy, and he wanted to share his understanding with his classmates. This gave him a topic and a general purpose, which he stated like this. Topic, music therapy. General purpose, to inform. So far, so good. But what aspect of this topic would you like to discuss? All right, highlight that. You see, that's another circle, right? Mm -hmm. If we use the analogy of concentric circles. So far, so good. But what aspect of his topic would Dwayne discuss? Okay? Continue, Larry. The kinds of facilities in which he had worked. That's a question. question. All right. His specific role as a performer. All right, another question. The evidence that music therapy can improve, can improve patients' mental health. Another question. The needs of patients with different kinds of illnesses. All right, another question. 
he had to choose something interesting that he could cover in a six minute speech. See, I had five minutes with the, with the uh, city council. Okay? All right, so now, but notice those questions. The kinds of facilities in which he had worked. Because that would make it unique. His specific roles as a performer. Because when you talk about music therapy, which, by the way, is an interesting topic. Uh, they call me the jazz man. Okay, because I love jazz. All right? Okay, so uh, I use jazz as music therapy for me. So if, I, if I'm hearing someone give a speech on music therapy, I'm going to be listening. Will he say or will she say something about jazz? Okay, all right. So you have to become very specific as you go. All right, continue, Larry. The needs of, of patients of different kinds of illnesses. Uh, Dr. he had to choose something interesting that he could cover in a six-minute speech. Finally, he settled on describing his most memorable experiences with patients to show how music therapy affected them. He stated his specific purpose this way. All right. The specific purpose. To Highlight to, that, please. To inform my audience about the benefits of music therapy for people with psychological or cognitive all right, now that is specific. Mm -hmm. Why is that specific, Larry? Because he broke it down to where his, his main point of was actually not only from his experience, but also how music affected the patients. What, to, what kind of patients? Uh, mental patients that he had with, that was dealing with uh, the psychological uh, impairments. All right. Okay, so he wanted to specifically deal with music therapy among mm -hmm. psychological or cognitive disabilities. Cognitive disabilities would be people who have trouble comprehending. So it's targeting yeah. the those type of patients. Yeah, those type of patients. It would, it would in a way, it would bring uh, a peace of mind to them to where they would calm down and they would relax. Yes. And then they would think, uh, uh, to think comfortably. Yes. But he was also saying that he's not dealing with the other patients at the nursing home that don't have that disability. That's right. Yes, That's a delimitation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that the, he's not dealing with all of them, he's dealing with specific ones. Exactly. Okay. All right, continue, Larry. This turned out to be an excellent choice, and Wayne's speech was, all, was among the best in class. Isn't that amazing? All right, continue. Notice how clear the specific purpose statement is. Notice also how it relates the topic directly to the audience. Mm -hmm. This is highlight that, please. The topic to the audience. The topic to the audience. The topic directly to the audience, and that was a specific audience, right? right. Those with psychological or cognitive disorders. Right. Okay. That is, it states not only what the speaker wants to say, but also what the speaker wants the audience to know as a result of the speech. All right. This is very important, for it helps keep the audience at the center of your attention as you prepare your speech. Very good. OK, any questions about what Deacon Larry read? Any questions, comments? What I like about it is that he used something that he experienced, a talent that he has and seeing how important it would be to help others. Mm -hmm. To reach out to those who were having difficulty to uh, meet with their own understanding. Yes. 
And also what I see that he's done, he asked questions with this topic that other people would might ask. So he narrowed it down to one specific point on mm -hmm. his talk. Yes, yes. And um, usually, Larry, when someone does that, they do it for a number of reasons. They target a particular audience, number one, because they feel they can address that topic with clarity and with enough information. Or, number two, it is a need yeah. that should be addressed. That's not being addressed. And I usually tell, I usually tell students the knowledge of a need constitutes a call. That's a quote that I've created. All right, I can't tell you where I got it from. I think it came from me. Okay. <laughs> the knowledge of a need constitutes a call. The knowledge of a need constitutes a call. And let's just call that quote an anonymous quote. Right? <laughs> okay, because I may have read it somewhere. But the point I'm making is that that statement is true. The knowledge of a need constitutes a call. When you see a need and you have the resources to address that need, you don't have to pray. You just do it. Because the knowledge of a need constitutes action. And if you have the resources to address that action, then you've just been called. The knowledge of a need constitutes a call. Now you'll find out that there's a lot of needs in the world. So you got to narrow your circle. And for him, it was psychological and cognitive disorders. Okay? The knowledge of a need constitutes a call. So, the NAACP had a need for blacks to address the issue of Jim Crow, specifically to the Lafayette City Council. All right? The knowledge of a need constitutes a call. But the specific call, okay, the specific call can only be addressed by someone who have the resources, psychological resources, information, <clears throat> and the like that would address that issue. All right, so the knowledge of the need constitutes a call. So when I see our church, and I look at the four acres of property that's sitting behind us that goes one block before Moss Street. The knowledge of a need is we got to clear that land. But who's called to do it? The knowledge of a need is one thing. But it constitutes a call for someone who have the resources to do it. Okay, so that means I have to get the resources and then I need to get experts who remove trees. You see what I'm saying? All right, so that could be any topic, but the knowledge of a need in a spiritual sense, the knowledge of a need constitutes a call. If you see something that you can address as a need, you've just been called. And so today, Lenora saw we had a need for some people. <laughs> yeah, you smelled it right there. <laughs> the knowledge of a need constitutes a call. She went out of her way. Thank you, Lenora. Yes, thank you. Yes. But the same is true in any aspect of life. Go ahead, Carla, that's so your is, question. Is that like when something, when, when God places something on your heart? Yes. Like, like for the, the soup kitchen? Thing. Yes. I, I don't know. What I was really thinking, you know, I knew it moved me. Yes. But it wasn't until I saw that, you know, because you look at them, the church, 
and it seems like they're able to do what they're doing for these kids. Yes. But when I saw they even ran out of soup, it, that's when it fell on my heart mm -hmm. to help. And that's when I reached out to you and asked you, could we donate, you know, in spirit of liberty's name to them? Sure. What we had to donate because we wouldn't use that for a certain mission. Sure. So, um, but it, it, for me, it did that and it goes beyond that. It's like I don't want to stop helping my own when I help just when I'm there. So this is why I've decided to take on that initiative. That's a good. And to send them something every month. That's a good initiative. So is that pretty much the same thing? That's a knowledge of a need. And it constituted a call once you are aware of that need and the resources that was given to you, you wanted to use it to address that need. That is definitely specific to what I'm saying. Um, and many times I've partnered with organizations like that and there have been schools I've attended in Africa or that I've visited in Africa that does not have cafeterias. So the first thing I did when I started providing aid to those schools is number one, how do you feed them now? Okay? Because I don't believe in reinventing the wheel. Secondly, who feeds them? Are they consistent? Thirdly, are they on the salary? Because if they are, then we need to look at finances, funding for it. Okay? Fourthly, is there a specific nutrition or nutritional goal you're trying to reach? The first time I went to West Africa, it was for drilling wells because the need was water. Okay? They were drinking water out of frog infested wells. Okay? That was their drinking water. Some people were eating the bark off of trees. For real. Okay. So we went to do um, a, a study of where wells need to, needed to be um, drilled or dug. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. So uh, what I would say, Carlette, is that it's one thing to have the knowledge of a need. It's another thing to have the resources to meet the need. It's another thing to have some history about that particular program. And it's another thing to know what the end goal is. For me, what I wanted to do when I adopted schools in Africa I wanted to hire people who can work on a consistent basis to feed those children. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't going to be just a hit and miss thing. Right. So I would get native people. I'd get, pe get people who were already volunteering and I would say to the pastor, we need to give them a stipend mm -hmm. so they can continue. Okay. Yes. So it's not just enough to provide food. If you have all of the food, if we send shipment of foods but no one to disperse it, no one to cook it. You see, so all of that comes into play. And ultimately, my end goal would be to develop a true feeding scheme for that school, which means maybe a cafeteria, maybe a group of four or five staff members who would manage that cafeteria, and that way the kids would have food consistently. In one of the schools I adopted, the teachers would bring a brown bag lunch to work for themselves. On many occasions, they fed the children from their brown bag because the kids wasn't coming with any food. And so most of the time, the teachers were feeding the students from their brown bag lunch. Well, that's what I wanted to get some more information from Apostle Oscar about, because they do responsibly. 
And if he's saying sometimes, like for many of the kids, it's their only meal, then once a week is a lot. If you're not eating, but it just still mm -hmm. doesn't seem like enough. Yeah, in your mind. In, in my mind. Yes, exactly. from your perspective, yes. I mean, I'd like to see them yes. be able to do it a little bit more, which I was happy because yeah. the money we left them from Spirit of the Week, he said they, they fed them three times that week. Look at that. Well, for, for the next couple of weeks, actually. Yeah, so, so the point I'm making is, uh, another thing that I would ask Carlette is, do you have a partnership right. with someone who is doing it when you're not? Right, because that day was just us and, and just people from the church. So, mm -hmm. so is that the only time they're getting fed is when they do it? Right, and, 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 and maybe so, maybe not. Mm -hmm. But maybe they have a partnership with another ministry that those people could go to the next week. Yeah, that's true. You see, on the next day or whatever. So you, you need to be informed. Yeah, I'm yeah. You, you need you need to be informed for sure. Uh, yeah, uh, frog infested wells. Oh, it was gray looking water. The drinking? They were drinking. Disease infested water. Okay. And 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 when they drink it, they don't get sick. But if you were drinking, they'll kill you. Where was it at? West Africa. Around Senegal. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Are you gonna take us to Nigeria? We're gonna work on that. But I am going to my shop expired. I'm not taking the most shop. <laughs> Where your shop expired, bro? I'm gonna have to go look at my yellow cord. <laughs> yeah, Doctor <laughs> Doctor Hill is there right now. I know I yeah, I saw his his Facebook. Yeah, Doctor Hill is there, but uh Doctor Hill didn't talk to me enough about that trip. Oh really? No, he didn't talk to me enough about it. I'll have to tell you later. Yeah. Just, yeah. He's a little bit too enthusiastic sometimes about what he does. Yeah. <laughs> you, you don't want to go to Nigeria without being fully prepared. Yes. I, a lot of the stuff I've heard, I'm glad I didn't go when I was planning on going. But I mean, I go with a group. You know, if you know what's going on in the sure. gym there, all right. Don't fear. <laughs> Dr. Lloyd is here. Lord is I got you. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Okay. But no, uh, it, it was wise for you, with it, Carla? Mm -hmm. Trust me. Yes. All right, any questions? Any questions about being specific with your purpose? All right, look at the gray area on page um, 83, and let's read it together. Using public speaking in your career. Read it with me. Your communication degree has helped you land a job as spokesperson for the mayor of a medium-sized city on the West Coast. A year after starting the job, you are selected to organize an information campaign explaining the benefits of a new youth center proposed by the mayor. To launch this campaign, you've decided to hold a news briefing at the end of the week. To open the briefing, you will present a short set of comments on the mayor's initiative. You decide to focus on your benefits of the youth center. Number one, it will offer a range of activities from sports to the arts in a safe environment. Number two, it will provide social networks for youth from all walks of life. Number three, it will operate most hours of the day and night. Number four, it will be free and open to everyone. Following the format used in this chapter, state the general purpose, specific purpose, central idea, and main points of your comments. All right, so that was uh, a, an exercise. Now, another thing, Carl, that you might remember when we went to visit um, the school, Sozo, remember? Mm -hmm. They had a feeding scheme for right. their school, but they didn't have a stove. Right. So we bought the stove, yes. Spirit of the Yes, <laughs> all right, so I, the first thing I asked was, where's the stove? Who's doing the cooking? They didn't have one. So By the time I came back to the United States, they had one. Okay, 
So you see, there's a lot of ways that you can contribute, but you gotta have the knowledge. Right. The knowledge of a need constitutes. And that's a good thing because it, it you know, it, um, it ensures that they will continue. Exactly. So, you know, I mean, it's yeah. not like you have to be there or you have to keep sending something, just that one thing right. at one time. And it also assures a hot meal. A hot meal, exactly. Yes. Yes. And I took a picture of that. That was a nice photo. It was, yes. Thank God. All right, now, let's move on to our next uh, aspect. And we've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Phrasing the central idea, page 89. Okay, we are going to move from purpose and specific purpose to framing, or <laughs> phrasing rather, uh, the central idea. All right, what is the central idea? Look in the right margin and highlight it. The central idea, a one sentence statement that sums up or encapsulates the major ideas of a speech. Highlight that. That's the central idea. Okay, notice a one sentence statement. I do the same thing in sermon preparation. In sermon preparation, you have to give a one sentence statement about your sermon. Same is true in public speaking. It's called the central idea, okay? The specific purpose of a speech is what you hope to accomplish. Highlight that, what you hope to accomplish, okay? The central idea is a concise statement of what you expect to say. In the sermon uh, class I teach, I give the topic. And the topic, what I was teaching for International Seminary, and when we had our local chapter here, I was speaking, I was giving a specific assignment for sermons on the Holy Spirit. So they had to give a one sentence statement on the Holy Spirit that they were going to address in their sermon. All right? The same is true in public speaking. It is uh, thus, this concise statement. Sometimes it is called, highlight this, the thesis statement, the subject sentence or the major thought, it's the same thing. Whatever the term, the central idea is usually expressed as a simple declarative sentence that refines and sharpens the specific purpose statement. All right, I'm gonna ask that you highlight the term or put it in your notes, declarative sentence. A declarative sentence, if I was teaching logic as I am now at Southern University, the term would be a proposition. A proposition is a declarative sentence that is either true or false, okay? So in logic, in philosophy, we use the term proposition, okay? And the proposition is a declarative statement or sentence that could be true or false. Your thesis statement is the same as your central idea, okay? Your thesis statement or your major thought is a proposition. It is a statement that you put in the form of a sentence. Are you with me? That's all it is. It's a sentence. Specific to what you want to say. Whatever the term, the central idea is usually expressed as a simple declarative sentence that refines and sharpens the specific purpose statement. Imagine that you run into a friend on your way to speech class. She says, I, I have to dash to my history lecture 
but I hear you're giving a speech today. Can you tell me the gist of it in one sentence? See that? Telling the gist of it in one sentence. Sure, you reply. America's prison system suffers from three major problems. Overcrowding of inmates. Lack of effective rehabilitation programs. And high expense to taxpayers. All right? Your answer is the central idea of your speech. It is more precise than your topic. Highlight that. It is more precise than your topic. America's prison system, or your specific statement purpose, to inform my audience of the three major problems facing America's prison system. You see, so your topic could be broad. Your, your, your uh, central idea is a concise sentence, <clears throat> statement about what you are going to say. Are we together? Okay. Another way to think of the central idea is as your residual um, message. Highlight that. Residual me message. What is the residual message? What a speaker wants the audience to remember after it has forgotten everything else in a speech. That's the residual message. What a speaker wants the audience to remember after it has forgotten everything else in a speech. Key points? Key points, yes. But in, in this case, it, it is a statement. It is a statement. It is a concise statement. Okay? That is the residual message. A lot of times in a sermon, I'll say something like this. If you don't remember anything else I say. Okay. If you don't remember anything else I say, remember this. Guess what that is? The central idea. Okay. I have a quick question. Yes, go ahead. Is that why you repeat some certain things in the message? I do. Yes, I, I repeat certain things in my message because it is going to be a point or points in my sermon. But it is also uh, a way to get people to remember things. I think it was Augustine, remember, in our class? What did he say? Repetition. Is the mother of wisdom. Yeah. Repetition. Mm -hmm. Is the mother of wisdom. Now let me ask you this, could you do that in a speech? Yes, you can. You can Not do too often, but you can. Yeah, you can. Okay. Yes, you can do it. And where you do it, Jane, is in your conclusion. Okay. What I have said today is. Yeah. And you're repeating it. Okay. You're doing it in your public speaking speech in the conclusion. The conclusion is always a summary. Yes? I'm going to tell you this, this, and that. And then part two, then you tell them all about it. Yes. And then part three is not going to tell you what I already told you. That's it. You got it. Yeah. That, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you remember that. That's right. That's what you're doing in a public speech and in a sermon. Same thing. Yes. So it's okay to use repetition. You can use it in the body of the sermon too. But usually, you're definitely going to use it in your conclusion. Yes. All right, let's move on to the next thing. And that is um, guidelines for the central idea. <clears throat> that is on page 90. 
What makes a well-worded central idea? What makes a well-worded central idea? Essentially the same thing that makes a well-worded specific purpose statement. Highlight that. The central idea, number one, should be expressed in a full sentence. Put it in your notes because you're going to want to go back to it sometimes. Number one, your central idea should be expressed in a full sentence. Number two, should not be in the form of a question. Number three, should avoid figurative language or symbolic language. Number four, should not be vague or overly general. All right, so those four things are important to your central idea. Number one, should be expressed in a full sentence. Number two, should not be in the form of a question. Let me say something about that. Your topic could be in the form of a question, but your central idea should not. Your topic could be in the form of a question, but your central idea should not. Your central idea is a statement. It's a declarative sentence. It is a proposition, okay? All right, so you can use a question in your topic. Okay? I did a midterm exam um, going on two weeks ago now. And I give my students usually an option of writing an essay or doing the test in class. And those who choose to do the essay have to pick a topic, I have to prove it, and then I have to prove what they're going to discuss in the topic, all right? And for instance, well, one of my students did an essay, but it's, uh, it, it's uh, call an argumentative essay. When you have an argumentative essay, you have to present pros and cons. What you are arguing for. So an argumentative essay is set up different than a regular essay. The first thing I had to correct the student on was that it couldn't just be on immigration. The topic she picked was on immigration. What's wrong with that topic? There it is. I said to her, immigration in the United States. Okay, and then she could set up her argumentative uh, uh, essay. All right, so the central idea have those four things that you want to uh, be aware of. All right, any questions about what we've covered? Look on page 91. Look in the margin next to the picture. Highlight it, please. Unlike the specific purpose, which you need to settle on early in the speech preparation process, the central idea usually takes shape later as a result of your research and analysis of the topic. That is important. Can you tell me why? Why do you think that is important? And why do you think it's true? Think about it for a moment. Think about it for a moment. Why is that important? Why do you think it's true? Carlette? Well, I think um, if you prepare for your speech, once you get most of the information together, the central idea comes in after that because the central idea is, is what you expect to say. And so you have to prepare first 
mm -hmm. and research and understand what you're speaking about in order for you to know what you're going on, you know, going to say in the speech. What you want your you central want. idea to be. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So, and, and so the central idea is what you expect to say, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Once you get your central idea, then you're going to give points related to your central idea. All right? Uh, why do you think that's important, Larry? Well, your points that you want to give your central idea, it would be what you remember. Okay. Just like you were saying before, the like it's in repetition, but it's in, but remember this. Yes. And that's, you know, the overall. That's your central idea. Central idea. Yeah, yeah. What is important about this is that your central idea can change after your research. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 That's true. You can decide you want to say something. Yes. And then after you've researched, yes. Then, yes yeah. Can. Your central idea can change. Your central idea can broaden, okay? Your central idea can be confirmed, or your central idea could be disproved right. as a result of your research. Yeah. So a lot of times, and, and uh, interestingly enough, I got a text from uh, South Africa yesterday, uh, a pastor that has written a book wanted to get my opinion. He actually wanted me to, I think, address the forward of the book. I've written forwards for a few people. And, and in, in um, uh, saying that, the idea is that you will know whether that's exactly what you want to communicate to your audience. So the title of my book is The Right Way to Pray. So I better tell them the right way, right? Okay, so my central argument is that there is a right way. Okay? Now, the point I'm making is that you write your book and give it a title after your research. After your research. Is it like brainstorming? Yeah. And like clusters of words that's going to fit into the brainstorming. You kind of like put your ideas um, after brainstorming of the topic that you're using. Yeah, you can write it all down. And then you narrow it. And like it's a hypothesis as well. It's like a central wise idea. Yeah, you said like what? A hypothesis too. Yes, a hypothesis though is a guess. Yes, yeah, called an educated guess. All right, the, the, the idea is that you will focus on your central idea after you looked at many other ideas. So it's after your research that you get your idea. Because it can change. You could start with what you think it's going to be, but you may end up with something altogether different. Okay? The same pastor I'm talking about, I recommended a ghostwriter for him. Someone that could actually write his book for him. But he wanted to go in a direction that that ghostwriter didn't agree. And she had valid reasons. I agreed with the writer. I didn't agree with the pastor. So he fired her and got another writer. <laughs> that would agree. That would agree with him. Okay. All right. Yeah, the only problem though is that when you're writing, you gotta write for your audience and you gotta write for your audience to be able to understand where you're going, okay? And if, if what you're writing is too broad, you might be saying a lot of things, 
but not only yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah you're, you're, you're defeating the purpose because you're clouding your topic with too many generalities you see some people talk like that oh some people Okay, like, where's the logic? Yeah, yeah. yeah. tell me. Even, even, in, even in school, like, you know, like, the teacher will be like, or the professor will be like, okay, <clears throat> a lot of us write, but we jump off topic. So, meaning, like, okay, you, you're talking about one subject and you're jumping to another one, and so sometimes we don't realize we do that even in speech. We do that. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and they tell you come back. Yes. I correct people yeah, all the time. I know what I'm thinking. Yes, yes. I, I correct people all the time. <laughs> and <laughs> even the person in my house. <laughs> okay, just in case you don't know who that is. Okay, all right. Now you started with one topic and you presented five more. And you didn't finish the first one. Okay, so. Oh, oh yeah okay <laughs> so a good listener will tell you okay. you didn't really say what you you know or you didn't in really English address English, yeah, yeah. You know, exactly earlier right i didn't finish my question <laughs> <laughs> you know just saying that it reminds me of like you said you have your outline to follow so then you do drift off you can come right back absolutely yeah. that's all yeah. purpose yeah 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 yeah. So the central idea comes out of your research, but your research is going to provide, in most cases, more information than you need. Okay? And because of that, you got to be strategic in what you want to accomplish because you're going to have more. And that's what I call a series of sermons. Okay? Yes. You see? Yes. So. Uh, you, you can so move on. Yeah. yeah. You can move on to something else. In this case, it's another book. You see? Yeah. And that's what I was telling him. Oh, yeah, that should. could be another book. Oh. You preach but, but when you want the other book to be in this book, then you got two books in a row. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Write two books. Yeah, just just you know, make that the second book. Make it the second book? All right, we're done for today. This was good stuff. I'm going to ask that you start reading Chapter 6, Analyzing the Audience, another important piece in public speaking, and we will get to that next time. And uh, that Saturday, I think, falls on the 21st, doesn't it? Which Saturday does it? The next public speaking class. Oh, the next class. Because today's the Yeah. Next is the Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the next class next week is systematic theology. Mm -hmm. All right. So the 21st, we're going to have to move that class because I have a wedding and I'll be flying back from Chicago. You're doing both classes. Both classes are going to be um, 10, ten weeks. weeks. Yes, ma'am. So next systematic theology is the last class. Because we just did week nine last week. Okay. Well, I may have to extend that. Because we, we we have one more, we're dealing with the church now. We need to have another topic. Okay. Yeah. So we'll we'll see. It'll be ten to twelve. All right, we're done. Let's pray, Father. We thank you again for this day. We thank you for the things that we've learned to make us better public speakers. Give us wisdom as we continue in the process of becoming public speakers. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs>